The challenges of a changing climate. Miami is the second most at-risk location in the world. Rising temperatures. People are going to start experiencing many, many more days with killer heat temperatures. Rising seas. You just have to up your ante. We need action now. We have no time to waste. It is time to move. Changes to our shorelines. This is the new normal along our beaches. Threats to life off our shores. The state of the Florida Reef Tract is dire. It's probably the worst coral disease outbreak that's ever been recorded. How do we adapt? We are designing alternatives to single-use plastic. What can we still change? If we don't start taking action soon, the ecosystems in the oceans will collapse. When it dies, we all die. This is our Climate Check. Welcome to the NBC6 Climate Check Special. I'm Angie Lastman. And I'm Steve McLaughlin. We are in a climate emergency, and over the next hour, we'll cover some of the pressing threats that climate change is posing to South Florida and the globe. From rising temperatures to rising seas to threats to our oceans and our tourist economy, even to the food that we eat. The main driver of climate change, of course, is heat. Temperatures are rising all over the globe in the air, in the water, and on the ground driven by record amounts of carbon in the atmosphere. Researchers are continually studying these extremes and what it'll mean for the world population. And the results for South Florida are especially alarming. People are going to start experiencing many, many more days with killer heat temperatures. We as a society cannot adapt our way out of this problem. We are running out of time quickly and now we need to take drastic action now. Two of the hottest years ever on record for Miami have come in the last three years. We've seen 118 90 degree plus days so far this year, and September and October entered the record books as the hottest ever. And it's not just Miami breaking records. Today, in Paris, almost 109 degrees. France hit an all-time heat record of 114.6 degrees in June. Globally, July 2019 was the hottest month ever. The last five Octobers were the five hottest ever. 18 of the 19 warmest years have all occurred since 2001. We know that our warming world is directly linked to greenhouse gas emissions, and scientists agree that it not only will get warmer, but the heat could get life-threatening. Historically, Miami has experienced on average only one day or so with a heat index of 105. If we don't take any climate action by the mid-century, Miami could be looking at 60 such days. Climate scientist Juan de Clet Barreto explains one finding from a recent study from the Union of Concerned Scientists. The study highlights an increase in frequency and severity of extreme heat days in the next few decades if our emissions are left unchecked. The most concerning finding was the number of what we call off the chart days in the heat index, which mean that literally the, ex, the relative humidity and temperature conditions are, so, are projected to become so high if we don't take action on climate change that they are off the National Weather Service's chart for calculating those. Heat index is the temperature that your body feels when you add humidity levels to the actual air temperature. According to Climate Central, since 1979, Miami has an average of 23 more days per year with a heat index of 90 degrees. That number is expected to skyrocket in the coming decades. These extremes will have an impact on us all in South Florida, but not equally. An estimated 25% of people in Miami are living below the poverty line, and they will be the hardest hit by more frequent and potentially deadly days of extreme heat. We think of climate change as a, a disparities multiplier of the disparities that already exist among different populations that are going to be magnified by climate change. It's going to vary according to you know, places like Overtown where we are right here compared to, to, uh, to more privileged and wealthier areas. That's for me one of the most concerning things and one of the biggest reasons for taking action on climate now. Miami is one of the most extreme examples of income inequality in the country and climate change goes hand in hand with that. If you're someone that lives in a high rise like these, you'll probably be fine. But it's those in low income areas and workers who will struggle to find relief from extreme heat. For middle income and the rest of us who have resources, we go from an air conditioned home to an air conditioned car to an air conditioned office. And we never get the exposure as poor people who have to take public transportation, who work our doors, or whose homes have no cooling area. Based just on economics, they're at higher risk. Dr. Cheryl Holder is an internal medicine specialist. The majority of her patients are uninsured, low-income laborers. 
all of which are already being impacted by our current heat levels. Many of my workers, if they don't work, they don't get paid. They're going to try and work through this. They're going to try, above all else, to keep surviving, which will then make the damage worse. And not having a cool place to go home to enhances the potential for heat illnesses. When you get hot all day, if you don't go to a cool environment, your body is not able to go back to the lower temperature. So the next time you go out, it increases your risk even more of decompensating earlier. If these workers can't afford to stop because of the extreme heat index, many cases of heat exhaustion and heat stroke will likely turn fatal. The impact is the risk that the population is at and will they stop because they're so desperate for the income. And it's not just laborers at higher risk. Kids playing outdoor sports will face increased danger. A lot of the coaches and parents aren't even aware that at 90 degrees, especially when they're wearing the helmets and all the, the clothes, it increases their risk of dehydration, collapse, because they don't sweat like we do, they don't get rid of the heat like we do. All the coaches, the parents have to be very much aware to protect the children. The potential for waves of killer heat is ominous, but when it comes to the future, it isn't set in stone yet. We need to mitigate those carbon emissions and we need to do it now so that we can avoid the worst. And that's just a scientific reality. The rapid action includes solutions that face significant political resistance, weaning off of fossil fuels, prioritizing renewable resources, investing heavily in public transportation, and an end to deforestation. Coming up on the NBC6 Climate Check Special. 40% of the world's land mass is occupied by livestock production. The footprint of meat, how the food on our tables is contributing to the climate emergency. The state of the Florida reef tract is dire. The invisible crisis, a mysterious disease is ravaging our coral reefs. This is the new normal along our beaches. The pattern is pretty clear. And massive blooms of seaweed are choking our shores. How much of our changing climate is to blame? We need action now. We have no time to waste. It is time to move. Plus, rising seas threaten South Florida. What is it going to cost to adapt? We're in a last ditch effort for the preservation of the controlling factor of our oceans. And the fight over fins, the battle lines to save sharks are being drawn right here in Florida. Welcome back to the NBC6 Climate Check Special. It's not just carbon that's driving climate change, so too is methane, as the world increasingly relies on meat to feed an ever-growing population. Carbon-absorbing trees are cut down for farmland, and a water crisis deepens. That leaves many concerns about sustainability globally and locally. Food has a, a water and energy footprint, and we, we like to call that an ecological footprint and meat has a footprint that is 20 times higher than that of beans, fruits and vegetables, uh, the basic components of a vegetarian diet. Meat's footprint begins when grains are grown and transported to livestock to be eaten. Once the meat from the livestock is harvested, it must be distributed around the country and even around the world. One of the biggest impacts is water. Okay, one hamburger, depending on who you ask again, ranges anywhere from 440 gallons per hamburger of water to produce up to 800 gallons. Well, these animals are born and they need to grow and they need to sustain themselves. We need to give them water. We need to uh, water the crops that they eat. We need to hose down, you know, after slaughter. Livestock produce methane as they digest their food. Then their manure produces even more methane as it decomposes. Methane is 30 times more potent than carbon dioxide as a heat trapping gas for the planet. That means meat production contributes to climate change, which in turn, contributes to the world's ongoing water crisis. Climate change causes an increasing number of, of droughts and prolonged dry seasons. It also, during rainy seasons, creates precipitation to often come in, in more condensed bursts. These bursts make it more difficult for the land to absorb water. Water is also absorbed less by land that is deforested. 40% of the world's land mass is occupied by livestock production. When forests are cut down to make room for animals, it's a triple whammy. Greenhouse gases are released into the atmosphere, there are less plants to take in carbon dioxide, and now animal production will increase the carbon footprint. 
On the University of Miami campus in Coral Gables, they're trying to address this at the grassroots level. So my role at the U is really to um, uh, promote, create, initiate a project that are gonna ha have a, a better impact on the environment. Since 2007, the University of Miami has pledged to reduce its carbon footprint. That means buildings that are LEED certified and reduced emissions, energy, water, and waste. But it also means educating students on their food choices. So trying to eat locally is definitely a way to lower the carbon footprint involved in those products that you eat. The reason is simple, is if we farm and we grow food next to where we live, it's going to lower the carbon footprint. It's pretty simple to understand. The university buys local in-season food from distributors as much as possible and even has its own sustainable garden that will eventually serve students. It's not just about where the food is grown, but what type of food is available. When we promote uh, dishes, we try to focus on the, the plant-based uh, options. Plant-based options, otherwise known as vegan options, have proven health benefits, but veganism at its core is about animal ethics. I knew nothing about environmental issues until I became vegan. The movement brought me to climate and environmental uh, understandings of what's happening in the world that I wasn't aware of before. And to those who say we need to eat meat to get enough protein? We're basically um, getting the nutrients from the earth that we need to sustain ourselves through the animals, okay? So they're the middleman. We can go straight to the protein, straight to the nutrients. The message to get out to people is not necessarily everybody needs to become a vegetarian or a vegan overnight, um, but that small changes in the diet, like doing a Meatless Mondays program or just swapping out some beef for, for chicken, pork, turkey, fish, things like that can actually make a, a measurable uh, contribution to reducing emissions. Foods that are produced locally, like at UM, also cut down on air and car miles, which in turn cuts down on emissions. Now, for those of you thinking of adding vegan meals to your diet but not sure where to start, head over to my Facebook page, Steve Mac NBC6. I've posted a few of my favorite spots around South Florida. Coming up on the NBC6 Climate Check Special. It's probably the worst coral disease outbreak that's ever been recorded. The race to save our reefs. While one team studies a deadly disease outbreak, another fights to rescue them. The warmer the water, the better the seaweed grows. We've never seen anything like it. The invasion of sargassum. Massive amounts of seaweed on our shores may be the new normal, but the cause is thousands of miles away. We need action now. We have no time to waste. It is time to move. Plus, rising seas threaten South Florida. What is it going to cost to adapt? If you were to take those apex predators out, the equilibrium of these ecosystems would collapse. And the fight over fins. The battle lines to save sharks are being drawn right here in Florida. Welcome back to the NBC6 Climate Check Special. While the effects of climate change are easier to see on land, they're equally devastating off our shores. Ocean temperatures are increasing at alarming rates, threatening marine life. And the most critical danger is faced by our coral reefs. They've been decimated, much of that die-off fueled by climate-related events. But researchers are racing to find solutions and save the Florida reef track any way they can. It's probably the worst coral disease outbreak that's ever been recorded. We are losing corals at an unprecedented rate. It started a few years ago, and it's like a wildfire burning through our reefs. The state of the Florida Reef Tract is dire. <laughs> our coral reefs are dying. Climate change, development, hurricanes, and pollution have been killing them. And now, disease. The stony coral tissue loss disease has been ravaging the reef for the past five years. And it's affecting some of our most valuable species, the ones that build the coral reef that we rely on. It's a disaster. You're seeing 500-year-old coral being chewed up. So this is stuff that's survived Columbus. It's a very visible phenomenon. The coral is white and sick, and it's, you know, to me it's just sad. The disease causes the tissue of the coral to degrade and fall off, turning vibrant reefs white as they die. It's pushing corals closer to extinction, and scientists are rushing to get answers. For two weeks this summer, an expedition by a group called Ocean X used this cutting edge research vessel to study 100 sites along the Florida reef tract. The goal for the Ocean X mission this trip 
was to get a pulse on the reef tract from Biscayne all the way down to the Dry Tortugas. Researchers think the disease is caused by bacteria and spread through the seawater. It appears to have started in the Miami area and spread north to Martin County, then south through the Florida Keys, carried by the currents. We take a syringe sample of seawater right above that coral because we, this, this pathogen is transmitted through the seawater. This is 50 milliliters. So like right down here, about one milliliter, there are one million bacteria in one milliliter of seawater. The Ocean X crew is also creating extensive 3D imaging to map much of the reef tract. So what you want to see for a healthy coral colony is this brown um, tissue but what we're seeing is the disease is all these white spots and it's, it's similar or synonymous to a forest fire kind of burning across the landscape or seascape. To see the imagery that we've created and to go down and witness with your eyes corals that are diseased and dying is sad because they are the foundation of this entire ecosystem and they're the foundation for the tourism and economy in this area. Warming seas and ocean acidification may have made it worse for corals by weakening their defenses. As uh, the environment changes, whether it's from global climate change or habitat degradation that corals are becoming more vulnerable to disease infection because they're becoming more immune compromised. We hope that this mission will give us a big step forward in understanding what's going on, give us insights potentially into the pathogen, and the ultimate goal is to prevent it from getting worse and to prevent this from ever happening again. How you doing sir? Good to see you again. As the scientists of Ocean X race to find answers, researchers at the University of Miami are racing to save corals before they get infected. And the situation has gotten so bad uh, that it's been decided that we should identify corals that are ahead of the disease outbreak and bring them into these land-based facilities to try to protect them from the disease while the disease outbreak goes through. We've got 413 corals to go between these three tanks. UM's Coral Rescue Operation is a collaboration with state and federal groups to save healthy colonies. So one of our teams is our reconnaissance team, and they're out in the water always looking for that leading edge of disease. We've seen it spread linearly through the reef tract. So instead of popping up everywhere simultaneously, we've really seen it move in a pretty consistent fashion um, north and south. And so we have a pretty good idea of where that leading edge of the disease is. Once the recon team finds where the healthy coral are, UM's rescue team dives into action. We have 22 species of coral that have been identified uh, for coral rescue. We had a team of 12. Uh, divers, and on average we could collect around 130 corals per day. Once they are rescued, the corals are brought back to UM's hatchery. From here, they will be stabilized and they're going to stay here for maybe four to six weeks or maybe longer. After being studied, cataloged, and nurtured at UM, these corals are then sent to aquariums across the country for more specialized care. During which time we will be developing our breeding and restoration strategies to take those corals back and continue the work here in Florida. The plan is to replant the offspring of these corals back into the track when it's safe. So these are corals that are ultimately going to be the next set of parents that we hope will interbreed and will use their offspring, their babies, to reseed Florida's reefs. Each one of these colonies can produce thousands of individual coral larvae or babies that can actually grow up and become new colonies. And because these corals didn't see the disease, it means that all of that genetic diversity that would ordinarily be lost is preserved here. We don't know when the disease will have run its course. In the meantime, we are still going to propagate some species and do some studies and put some corals out and test and see what their success is going to be to let us know When's the right time we can start? We do know that when it is time, we will be ready. And the restoration of our reefs is a necessity for our safety, fish supply, and economy. Those reefs are really important, not just for biodiversity reasons and because they're the rainforests of the sea, but they actually protect our coastlines from storms. Here's a situation where the natural resources are actually helping protect us from those threats, and yet we're not taking the necessary measures to protect them from the threats that we ourselves are creating. I think we have to realize that Miami has an environmental economy and it's worth money. Unless you value your economy, your environment, you're not going to have it available to be sustainable in the future. And so all of those things that we take for granted that sustain our essentially tourist economy are going to be lost. We have this amazing asset, this amazing resource in, in the Keys, and it's our all collective responsibility to protect it. It's the only barrier reef that we have in our 
country. It's the main place for Americans to come and see coral reef. And we, we owe it to ourselves and the world to do what we can to protect it. And it's, it's hurting right now. UM researchers have successfully spawned these corals in their land-based facilities and will continue to expand the scope of their efforts in anticipation of replanting them on our reefs when it's safe to do so. And scientists are also genetically engineering more resilient corals that can handle and thrive in warmer waters. Coming up on the NBC6 Climate Check Special. We have all heard about our carbon footprint. What you don't hear so much about is the human nitrogen footprint. The nitrogen footprint. While carbon and methane assault our atmosphere, how is this chemical threatening our beaches? We are designing and building alternatives to single-use plastic. The plastic problem. How a local business is fighting for a more sustainable way and enlisting students to help. The taxpayers alone can't shoulder this, so we need to figure out who is going to pay and how that's going to happen. Plus, rising seas means rising costs. Will adaptation bust our budget? The Shark Fin Trade Elimination Act would be a ban on the sale and trade of shark fins in the United States. And the fight over fins, how the future of sharks may be decided in Washington. If you spent any time on the South Florida beaches over the summer, you surely noticed a lot of seaweed both on shore and in the water. And if you couldn't see it, you may have smelled it. It's called sargassum, and it's been a worsening problem in South Florida and the Caribbean. It's not just a changing climate that's causing these massive blooms. It's fueled by activity as far away as the Amazon. We've seen hurricanes, we've seen rainstorms, king tides on South Beach, but this is a new one, the invasion of the sargassum seaweed. South Florida has a seaweed problem. This is sargassum, and it's everywhere. Sargassum is a brown seaweed that uh, calls home the Sargasso Sea, the central gyre of the North Atlantic Ocean, that provides habitat to over 100 species of fishes and over 100 species of invertebrates. Sargassum is a good thing. It's a fish factory when it's offshore. But when it comes ashore, in excessive amounts, it becomes problematic. FAU's Dr. Brian LaPointe has been studying the Great Atlantic Sargassum Belt for decades. That's a 5,500 mile stretch from the Gulf of Mexico to West Africa, home to more than 20 million tons of this floating seaweed. Based on what we have seen over the past decade, since 2011, we have seen this ramping up, up and away. 2014 was the worst year ever in the Gulf of Mexico for sargassum. 2015 was a bad year all around the Caribbean. 2018 was even worse. What exactly is causing the overgrowth of sargassum that we see washing up on our shores more so than we did um, 10, 15 years ago? We have all heard about our carbon footprint, the CO2, and its relationship to climate change. What you don't hear so much about is the human nitrogen footprint. And that nitrogen footprint traces to thousands of miles away, to the Amazon rainforest. Every minute, an area the size of one and a half soccer fields is being deforested. That is being replaced with some type of agriculture, cattle farming, and increasing use of fertilizers. Plants need nitrogen in large amounts to grow, and fertilizers are a buffet of it. The deforested Amazon areas require heavy use of them. Much of that fertilizer then seeps into the Amazon River when it rains, and it's made worse by a changing climate. There are other aspects of climate change that are clearly playing a driving role in feeding the sargassum bloom, and that is extreme rain events, which they have been seeing extensive flooding since 2009. Th that combination leads to increased nutrient runoff from the Amazon basin down into the tropical Atlantic Ocean where those nutrients, particularly nitrogen, is feeding the sargassum bloom. And the other thing is, of course, the earth is warmed up, the seas are warmed up, and the warmer the water, the better the seaweed grows. We've never seen anything like it. Dr. Stephen Leatherman is a coastal ecologist for FIU. Nicknamed Dr. Beach, he's studied coasts for more than 40 years. He sees a seaweed problem that's more than just an eyesore on the beach. 
One of the big problems is going to be tourism. People don't like it. It stinks. It sits there and rots and attracts flies and it smells like rotten eggs and it's very unpleasant. The potential economic consequences for South Florida and its beaches are very real. They don't have to look very far for proof. And they've already seen this problem in the, in the Caribbean where some islands are just covered with their beaches and why would you go there? And the sand is completely covered. The water out to 100 feet was choked with this stuff. It's driving tourists away and and that clearly is, is you know, the economic engine of, of the Caribbean region. The sargassum also has an environmental impact. It strips the oxygen out of the water, and at that point you get toxic hydrogen sulfide fumes being emitted from the water or the beach. It causes fish kills, die off of seagrasses and corals along the beaches, and creates dead zones, which is, is not good. What do we do with all of this that's washing up on our shores? Is there anything that can be done with it? There are many things that can be done, and that's the great thing about this. If this was just global warming, then there, was, there would be very little we could do about it. But the good news is here, this is actionable. We can take action and actually make a difference in this problem. We need to do a better job as housekeepers in Florida and begin focusing more, treating our wastewater. And we can do this. We're already doing this in parts of Florida and we're seeing very positive results. Miami-Dade County is searching for solutions to this problem. They've been plowing it under. They use a plow type of device, plowing the material under and burying it under sand. And so that's worked out very well. But now there's so much of it that they can't possibly get all underneath the the sand. My beach calculates it could cost as much as 45 million a year just to clean this seaweed off. That's a big expense that we haven't seen in the past. One solution is using sargassum as mulch. And in Mexico, they're harvesting sargassum offshore and even turning it into bricks to build houses. The ultimate part of this challenge is to develop methods to reuse sargassum in a way that's beneficial for mankind. This growing problem will require creative management and also a lot of time. The solutions are not going to happen overnight. That's going to take decades to improve our nitrogen footprint. And we'll have plenty of opportunity to figure it all out. We don't know how much worse it's going to get, but this is the new normal that we're going to have to adapt to excessive amounts of sargassum coming in along our beaches. The pattern is pretty clear. Coming up on the NBC6 Climate Check Special. We are designing and building alternatives to single-use plastics. The last straw, one company's push to stick a fork in single-use plastic. Taxpayers alone can't shoulder this, so we need to figure out who is going to pay and how that's going to happen. Ground zero, rising seas are raising the stakes. Can South Florida afford adaptation? And who should have to foot the bill? If you were to take those apex predators out, the equilibrium of these ecosystems would collapse. And preying on the predator, how the shark fin trade threatens the balance in our oceans. the last few years, we've reported on various cities across South Florida banning the use of plastic. Usually we think of the impact to South Florida's vast marine life. But plastic also has a connection to the environment and to climate change. One South Florida company is focusing on plant-based utensils and trying to educate the next generation of South Floridians. Each year, the planet produces 300 million tons of plastic. Half of that will only be used once then thrown away. Think about it, it's the products that we use usually for less than 10 minutes that are not renewable, that will pollute our ecosystem, our soil, our groundwater, our oceans for the next 500 years. It's not just about pollution, it's also about climate change. Most plastic is made from fossil fuel, a major cause of global warming, which leads to sea level rise. Lean Orb is a Miami-based company trying to be part of the solution. We are designing and building alternatives to single-use plastics when it comes to disposables for restaurants and hotels. Today we created alternatives for um, takeout clamshells and cups, straws, plates, cutlery. 
Lean Orb says its products are industrial compostable and usually disintegrate in under 90 days. Most of the materials that we use are natural fibers, so we're working a lot with wheat straw and sugarcane, bamboo, banana leaf, birch wood. Last year, the company began working with Miami Beach Restaurant and Juice Bar under the mango tree. It has been one of our biggest goals to help the environment and make, even if it's a small change, but educate also people. Under the Mango Tree uses straws and utensils from Lean Orb. They sell mason jars for $2 that customers can reuse over and over. Bring in the mason jar and you'll get a discount on your smoothie. They also encourage people to eat in instead of wasting to-go containers. And their bowls are made from renewable byproducts of wheat straw. We feel very comfortable with giving people the bowls to send out to go and walk around and then they could, you know, throw it out. And we know that in a few weeks it'll be comp completely biodegradable. When it comes to the future of plastic, the power to make change lies in the hands of our youngest citizens. We're about five blocks from the beach and many of our kids spend their weekends playing, swimming, snorkeling, doing everything on the beach and in the sand. So they're very aware that plastics, trash, plastic bags, straws end up in our waterways, in our beaches, in our drainage systems and damage wildlife. Last year, Lean Orb teamed up with South Point Elementary School to begin a partnership for education and change. We are providing them with paper straws and wooden cutlery that is fully compostable while educating younger generation on things that they can do today and the difference that they can make by not only using these products at school but also inspiring and bugging their parents. My kids absolutely talk about this at home. They are very environmentally aware. They do not like to use plastic straws. They will decline them at restaurants. They really don't want anything to do with plastic bottles. They both have their reusable waters that they fill up on their own independently. This school year, reusable utensils will be available at every elementary school in Miami Beach, and plastic straws will no longer be available in the Miami-Dade County public school system. Plastic, carbon, methane all contribute to the global climate emergency, but temperatures aren't the only thing on the rise. So too are seas. And with South Florida being such a low-lying area, sea level rise is one of the most immediate threats. The cost to adapt will be hefty. As temperatures around the world continue to rise, the threat of rising seas worsens for South Florida. The World Bank had declared Miami as the second most at risk in terms of assets at risk of location in the world. David McDougall is part of the Miami Climate Alliance, a group of 80 organizations working to address the climate crisis. Ocean levels are up four inches since 1994 and rates of increase are continuing to accelerate. The latest assessment from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change projects the minimum sea level rise around the globe will be between 11 inches and 2 feet by the end of the century. Miami sees these effects more frequently in the form of king tides or sunny day flooding. These problems will worsen as will the costs to address them, costs that are staggering. Just for seawalls alone across the country, it's $400 billion over the next 15 years. For Florida alone, it's $76 billion. That estimate is from a recent study conducted by the Center for Climate Integrity, a research group of engineers specializing in climate adaptation and geographers from the University of Colorado using data from NOAA. Florida is the costliest state, nearly double any other in the contiguous 48. The Keys are especially of concern. Their congressional district would be the 10th costliest in the country. What's more troubling is that these estimates are calculated using conservative figures, and seawalls account for just 15% of the total adaptation cost. But our entire operating budget for the state of Florida this year is $91 billion. So where does that money come from? The taxpayers alone can't shoulder this, so we need, we need to figure out who is going to pay and, and how that's going to happen. We need to make a, a sort of concerted effort to understand the enormity of the challenge and how we need to push for the big decision points. Frances Colon is part of the Miami Sea Level Rise Committee. She's a scientist who worked in the U.S. State Department for 10 years under two presidents. We know that the impacts are coming pretty fast, um, but I think what our volunteer board, the Sea Level Rise Committee, hopes is that we can move 
faster on these things and that we can figure out where the resources are going to come from because the truth is that the price tag is going to be pretty high. Cologne and the Miami Climate Alliance are also trying to ensure that climate adaptation considers all of the county's citizens. The budget right now will not be able to do everything. So how are we going to prioritize the measures that are going to protect the most vulnerable while also looking at protecting assets that we need to protect along the coast and do it the right way. The longer term problem is the one that we're, we're in the process of uh, evaluating and studying and we'll have a report at the end of the year on, on sea level rise strategies. Jim Murley is the Chief Resiliency Officer for Miami-Dade County. His job is to assess the impact of a changing climate on the county's vulnerable areas. He's confident the challenge of sea level rise can be met with innovation. The people that came before us learned how to manage the water, they raised the land, and they kept at it. We need to start on that base, understand the, you know, what worked and what didn't, and build on that because it is a day-to-day, year-to-year, decade-to-decade business. Miami voters have already approved $192 million in climate adaptation through the Miami Forever Bond. After a lot of organizing, a lot of pressure, there now is $600 million in every annual operating budget to address um, resilience in the county, and $16 billion in the capital plan that's the five-year plan for the county to address sea level rise related infrastructure projects. Miami Beach and some parts of Broward and Palm Beach have seawall projects in place. But because of the porous limestone foundation underground, seawalls can only do so much. Groundwater is a key to this. You know, we, we live on a sponge. Salt water tends to be heavier and will push the fresh water that's below us in the aquifer up. And as it comes up, it leaves less room for uh, stormwater. Other projects like stormwater pumps and elevating buildings and roads are also underway. Septic tanks and inland waterways will also have to be addressed. These measures are near-term fixes, but the root cause needs to be addressed as well. We need to make our elected officials conscious that they need to start putting a price tag on carbon that we need to have better um, energy standards, clean energy standards. As more and more carbon is pumped into our atmosphere by the burning of fossil fuels, temperatures in the air and in the water increase. Warmer oceans cause seawater to expand, causing half of the rise. A hotter planet also results in melting glaciers and ice sheets, accounting for the other half. When the ice that's on top of Greenland and Antarctica melts, it changes the volume of the water in the ocean. So that's the game changer that we're all uh, observing. The Miami Climate Alliance and other advocacy groups want the fossil fuel industry to help finance sea level rise adaptation costs. They argue those companies should be required to pay their fair share for knowingly contributing to the greenhouse gas problem. So the fossil fuel industry needs to be held accountable and they need to pitch in financially to help us solve this problem and give us solutions. The undeterminable price tag is the biggest obstacle the committee is facing. It'll be billions, but it won't be all one year. Future budgets are going to have to address this. You have to start looking at investments that you hopefully can partner with the state and federal government. We as government need to engage the, the large uh, foundational institutions and make them equal partners with us. We need them to invest in their own resources because we all have the same threats, the same vulnerabilities, and we, we share the, the fact that we may have these losses if we, don't, if we don't move forward. And you just have to up your ante. I see glimmers of hope. I know that the people are aware and that they're conscious. There's no alternative for the public government and the cities not to try uh, to do this. This is the basic quality of life of our community. We have 12 years before we are going to have impacts on us that it might be irreversible. We need action now. We have no time to waste. It is time to move. The city of Miami seems to agree that it's time to move. They declared a climate emergency in November due to the very real threat sea level rise presents. And the Florida Keys also understand that reality. They've conceded that some parts of the Keys may need to be abandoned because the cost of adaptation is too steep. Coming up next. Their body is really just left to sink where eventually they'll bleed out or they'll slowly suffocate. The fight over fins. A gruesome practice is put in the crosshairs as Florida takes the lead in trying to protect sharks and what the ocean's oldest predator means to the ecosystem and our economy. Welcome back to the NBC6 Climate Check Special. 
The push to ban the shark fin trade here in Florida and across the country is intensifying. Today, shark conservationists are a big step closer to that reality and the chance to slow the decimation of these misunderstood predators who are vital to healthy oceans. We're in a last ditch effort for the preservation of the controlling factor of our oceans. Sharks are worth more alive than dead. The war on sharks needs to be ended. The battle lines for the future of the global shark population are being drawn here in Florida. Shark researchers and conservationists are fighting for the survival of the species while also fighting the perceptions. I feel that it's easy to portray them as an evil killer and a brainless animal with teeth when really they're very intelligent. So if we can change people's perceptions, we can change the conservation status of sharks. While much of the public conversation centers on the threats sharks pose, little is on the threats they face. Nearly one-fourth of shark species are threatened with extinction. About 75 to 100 million sharks are killed globally every year. The United States is the seventh worst country in the world for killing sharks, and Florida is the worst state in the nation. In Florida, we kill 1.5 million sharks per year. Of that, 900,000 are from the commercial shark fishery. Jim Abernethy is a Palm Beach native and shark expert. He's been diving with sharks for 50 years. 90% of all the large sharks worldwide have already been removed. The population decimation is staggering and it can have unintended consequences for the ecosystem. So sharks have been around for 400 million years. That's longer than dinosaurs. That's even longer than trees. Essentially, they have shaped the oceans, you can think of them as the white blood cells. They eliminate any of the diseased, dying or dead. If you were to take those apex predators out, the equilibrium of these ecosystems would collapse. We need sharks to maintain healthy fish populations. Everything is a balance, the ecosystem is a balance, and once you take that top predator out of the ecosystem, you throw off the balance in the ocean. Warming seas, ocean acidification, and habitat degradation due to a changing climate are all contributing to the sharp decline. So too is overfishing and its most gruesome practice. The largest threat I would say is fishing for the shark fin trade. So the shark fin trade is a global market for shark fins that are being distributed throughout the world. It's an incredible threat to these animals. A lot of them are being caught in open water on the high seas where there is little regulation. A warning, some of these images are disturbing. The shark finning practice is, is extremely cruel and inhumane. It's usually done where the shark is caught, the fins are cut off of his body while they're still alive and dumped back in the ocean. Their body is really just left to sink where eventually they'll bleed out or they'll slowly suffocate. Shark finning is illegal in United States waters, but not on Florida's shores. Fishermen can cut the fins from sharks when they return to port. Those fins can then be sold in the global market and Miami has been the hub of the trade here in the U.S. for the last four years. We don't want to be part of the problem that's, that's taking all the fins like they are presently from Ecuador and Costa Rica that come through Miami in order to go to Asia where the demand is. The value of the fin is worth so much that this shark fin trade is very comparable to the ivory trade where they kill the elephant just for the ivory or the rhinoceros horn trade. The fins are used to make shark fin soup, a delicacy and a status symbol in many areas of Asia. Within the fins of a shark they have these these rays, they're called fin rays, that go up into the dorsal fin of the animal and those fin rays are almost like noodles. It's colorless, odorless, practically tasteless. 73 million sharks end up in the shark fin trade each year and they are being killed at a rate much faster than they can reproduce. They're big animals, they reproduce, you know, like mammals do. They're very late to, to reach maturity where they can have young, and then they have very few young. And now, the fight to save them has reached Congress. So Oceana is working on the Shark Fin Trade Elimination Act, and the Shark Fin Trade Elimination Act would be a ban on the sale and trade of shark fins in the United States. That bill passed the House of Representatives in November with broad bipartisan support. And now the companion bill heads to the Senate. We're very hopeful that it will pass this year and we're really working on a lot of public support on this campaign because eight out of 10 Americans support a ban on the sale and trade of fins. Meanwhile, other conservation groups are trying to pass a ban at the state level as well. Right now, Shark Allies is advocating for a bill to ban the fin trade in Florida. So it would basically ban the sale, trade, and possession. Shark finning is already banned in 12 states and Canada just outlawed the practice, the first G20 country to do so. 
Not everyone is embracing these proposals. Commercial fishermen licensed to catch sharks have concern it takes away a source of income. We're not trying to take away their livelihood or stop commercial fishing in any way. We're just really focusing on the fin trades. If you don't have sustainable ecosystems in the ocean, you're not going to have a healthy ocean and you're not going to have fish to be fished once that comes around. The economics appear to be stacked in the corner of conservationists. Shark ecotourism is booming and dwarfs the market for shark fins in the state. Oceana commissioned an independent study and they found that $377 million was brought into Florida's economy in one year, whereas fins being exported from the state was only $1 million. So there's really no comparison on the diving versus the fin trade here in Florida. It's a no-brainer. We all benefit by having more sharks. And the private sector may be joining the fight. Greg Cook is the general manager of the Ritz-Carlton in Fort Lauderdale. He teamed with the University of Miami and the Discovery Channel for Shark Week. We walked through the markets of Hong Kong and to see the amount of shark fins literally stacked up 10, 15 feet high in storefronts uh, for people to make shark fin soup um, really you know, kind of hit us. And that's why we need to have more uh, awareness around the sharks um, and again, and what's happening to them worldwide and protect them. Even if the ban passes at either level, it still doesn't address the global market problem. The benefit of this bill would be that we are not putting into the market, in theory, driving down demand for these products. International groups are tackling those by using celebrities like former NBA player Yao Ming and actor Jackie Chan in public service announcements advocating against the shark fin trade. Remember, when the buying stops, the king can too. The success of the House bill has conservationists hopeful. They also have more than 35 co-sponsors in the Senate. To them, the cost of doing nothing is a future none of us can afford. If we don't start taking action soon, the ecosystems in the oceans will collapse. We need healthy oceans. It is quite simply the heart of our planet. When it dies, we all die. Conservationists in Florida are doubling down on their efforts here, but they have yet to convince Florida senators to sign on. Senator Rubio has co-sponsored his own bill that allows the shark fin trade to continue, but only if it uses sustainable fishing practices. A Senate vote has not yet been scheduled. Well, thank you for watching the NBC6 Climate Check special. The NBC6 team will continue to bring climate change stories affecting South Florida to everyone. For more on these stories, log on to NBC6.com and the NBC6 app and just search Climate Check. Good night.